Hello, and welcome to the Biophilic Cities webinar series. I'm Rebecca Fornaby, a research associate with the Biophilic Cities Project at the University of Virginia. Through this series, we'll hear from practitioners and researchers who are designing resilient and adaptive urban nature, engaging the public to protect and enhance their blue and green infrastructure, and addressing environmental justice issues through research and on-the-ground projects. The Biophilic Cities Project started at UVA in 2011 to explore and advance nature in cities. In the fall of 2013, the Global Biophilic Cities Network was launched with partner cities spanning the globe from Phoenix, Arizona, Singapore, and Wellington, New Zealand. The webinar series is one of many ways in which the new Global Biophilic Cities Network will help to disseminate knowledge about the innovative work of cities, organizations, and individuals around the world. To learn more about the project, visit us at biophiliccities.org. Facebook, and Twitter. Today we'll be hearing from J.D. Brown, an attorney whose practice is focused on land use and environmental law. J.D. received his undergraduate degree from the University of Virginia, his law degree from Georgetown, and has now returned to Virginia to pursue a degree in urban and environmental planning. In Portland, Oregon, J.D. was a staff attorney with the Craig Law Center, where he helped to spearhead the organization's coastal law project, which is focused on providing pro bono assistance to coastal communities to help them address local land use and environmental issues. J.D. lives in Charlottesville, Virginia, and is currently working with the Biophilic Cities Project to develop model codes and policies for use in biophilic planning. J.D. will speak for about 30 minutes and then answer a few questions about his work. So welcome, J.D. Thanks, Rebecca. Uh, so today, uh, the presentation, uh, I hope to cover a survey of some legal codes that we've looked at over the last year at the Biophilic Cities Project with the goal of providing examples for other cities to look at uh, when they are interested in increasing the abundance of nature in their cities and also access to nature in their cities. So just to, for those who are new to the concept of biophilia, the term was first used by Eric Fromm, uh, who described biophilia as the love of life or living systems. And then E.O. Wilson popularized the term uh, when he described the evolutionary adaptation that humans have with nature. And when there's a disconnect, the kind of mental and psychological repercussions uh, that result. And I often describe biophilia and the whole biophilic effort as how to increase access to nature for our daily lives. So in the places that we live, how do we find nature and interact with nature in new and interesting ways? And the Biophilic Cities Project at the University of Virginia is documenting what cities around the world are doing to increase nature and interaction with nature in cities, and then also uh, advance the theory and practice of planning for biophilic cities. And so one piece of that puzzle is identifying legal codes and policy mechanisms that cities can use to, to achieve this end. And so why plan for cities with nature? Well, it's a rapidly urbanizing world, and gradually, you know, we want to have nature where people are living. So the traditional model is protecting and conserving nature in parks, you know, much like the national park system in the United States. Uh, as a place where people travel to and experience nature. Uh, but with the biophilic movement, we see the value of having nature at your doorstep and having interactions on a daily basis. Uh, and in particular, in cities, we often see a disparity for access to nature. So for low-income neighborhoods, uh, there is the, the least access to nature uh, and all the values that that provides. There is uh, increasing research, you know, some of the research that we're doing at the Biophilic Cities Project, and, you know, increasingly over the last few years is documenting the health and mental well-being benefits of access to nature on a daily basis, but also the benefits of green infrastructure in cities uh, for sustainability and resiliency needs. And there's also economic value. Um, we see properties uh, with green landscaping have increased value uh, commercial districts with mature trees attract more customers and generate more business, and cities are recognizing that people want to live in places with access to nature, and so to attract the businesses and industries that help their economic 
growth, uh, cities realize the need to um, have an abundance of nature and have that accessible to residents. So today I'll look at a variety of codes from different places. Um, try to touch on, you know, a lot of the different subject matter that you're seeing these different codes in and discuss some of the innovative approaches. But I've drawn some themes from the different codes that I've looked at. And one right off the bat is innovation. And by innovation, I don't mean reinventing the wheel because a lot of the type of codes and legal mechanisms that we're seeing um, have been around for a long time. So, for example, you know, land use controls like zoning, but they're being applied in new and interesting ways to protect different values than zoning was traditionally applied to protect. Uh, these codes are also largely flexible and incentive driven. And by that, I mean they're falling on the, the side of carrots as opposed to sticks. Uh, and that makes a lot of sense because there's limited resources and limited ability to achieve a lot of the goals of planning for nature. And so to the extent that you can create an incentive for private actors to undertake some of these different efforts, um, you're going to have the best results. Um, the next kind of major theme that we'll see with the codes is adherence to ecological principles. And so one of the failings of traditional regulatory approaches is they're written in stone, and they don't necessarily take into consideration the recognition that nature is ever-changing and often unpredictable. So that to the extent that these laws can build in a tolerance for unpredictability, uh, they have the most success. The connectivity is another major ecological theme, and this really draws from kind of the basic tenets of green infrastructure planning which is the need to have both intact cores in urban areas where nature can be wild and flourish, uh, but also having connectivity between those major cores and centers so that wildlife can find movement through heavily populated areas, uh, while at the same time uh, creating an integration between these settings, these natural settings, and the larger urban landscape so that people can access these areas and have interaction. A last, uh, two more major themes. One is diffuse decision making. And by that, I mean cities are really at the forefront of developing new policies and creating new opportunities uh, in this area of the law in particular. And they create new unique partnerships between government and private actors. And so to the extent that cities can mold the law to their unique local circumstances, they become the laboratories for experimentation, which is really what the whole design of the federalist system between our national government and our state governments is. But we've seen stagnation at those levels of government and lawmaking. So to the extent that cities might have uh, more independence in crafting new and unique laws, um, that has value. And the last piece of the puzzle is information gathering. And by that, I mean kind of the dual value of good data, which helps you know, inform the best decisions and the most effective results. So we can design all sorts of interesting legal mechanisms, but if they're not supported by good information at the outset, um, you, know, you don't always get the best results. And so a couple of broad categories of legal mechanisms that these uh, different laws fall into. The first is the traditional land use control, which is uh, zoning, uh, which typically controls and influences the design of development on a site-by-site -site basis. Uh, and this is a form of zoning which sets into place the current vision for how communities should look and feel. Uh, which is often hard to embrace the evolving understanding for community design while also respecting individual property ownership and investment-backed expectations. So zoning, you know, has a vision and it puts land use controls to, you know, 
design communities for that vision, but doesn't necessarily have the ability to evolve over time. Uh, so some innovative techniques like overlay zoning can add an additional level of restriction or regulation on top of the existing zoning scheme uh, and account for some more, the more natural features of the landscape. So for example, you might have a residential zone, but overlaying that you would have a overlay zone that would protect wildlife corridors or flood zones. Another more innovative type of the traditional zoning model is performance zoning, where end goals are identified, such as you know, reductions in stormwater control, but then the method as to how to achieve that end result is left up to the individual property owner. And that can provide you know, flexibility and potentially cost efficiency for individual owners to meet that end goal in different ways. The last traditional land use control is development impact fees and taxes. And traditionally, we would think of that in the realm of you know, costs for new roads and other public services that are associated with new developments. But you know, we can broaden that to also think about impacts to the existing natural environment at the time the new development is put in place. You know, loss of wildlife habitat, loss of mature trees, and there could be fees and taxes associated with that. Um, on the other side of that land use process are the carrots, which are the incentives, which I talked about briefly before. And there's, this is, there's a lot more in this category, um, like incentive zoning. Uh, one example is uh, providing a density bonus for uh, the adoption of green roofs. So if a developer develops a new building, puts a green roof on that, the developer would be permitted to build higher or build a larger footprint for that development uh, in, as a result of putting the green roof on the building. And that can have a win-win a for the developer who wants to attract buyers who desire increased presence and accessibility of nature and at the same time have more units, you know, more to sell, really. Um, the other side of the development impact fees and taxes is tax credits and breaks. Uh, so a municipality can budget for biophilic improvements on the income side of the equation by saying, you know, we'll take less taxes uh, and less fees and less funding on the income side uh, in return for you agreeing to, you know, control stormwater, you know, build other biophilic features, provide public access to open spaces, the like. Um, last part of incentives is uh, recognition and technical assistance. Uh, so it's not always funding that can promote some of these efforts. Sometimes it's just being recognized and being able to advertise that you've done these biophilic improvements and they're somehow connected to the larger effort that's being undertaken in an urban area. Or it's simply, you know, having the technical know-how as to how to accomplish these that is simply enough uh, to really create the incentive for for developers to undertake these projects. Uh, again, information and collection sharing is uh, a critical piece of a lot of these laws. So having the data up front uh, to inform the, the process and you know inform you as to what needs to be protected and how to best protect that. Uh, and the last category is property purchase and accessibility. Um, transferable development rights um, allow a municipality to identify an area for conservation and then take the development rights that would normally be associated with that area and allow the owners of those properties to transfer them and either sell them or use them at a different location. And one example is the development of the High Line in New York City. So the development of where the High Line stands, those development rights were TDR was developed for that area, those owners took those rights, used them or sold them elsewhere in the city with the result that they made some um, income off the ownership of the property and the High Line 
was was developed in what is now a very high rent uh, part of the city. Uh, purchase of development rights are kind of the opposite approach, which is a municipality will develop a fund for the purchase of properties uh, and then identify a category of land that it's interested in investing in, you know, whether to develop parks or to protect flood zones. And then owners of that qualifying land can sell their property to the municipality. Um, it works well when, in particular, when there is essentially low market value for some of those those areas, which makes the owners interested in, in selling to the municipality for this opportunity, but also allows the municipality to uh, purchase these properties for conservation at, at a lower market value. So that's kind of the background of the different uh, legal tools that uh, we've looked at. Uh, and so the rest of the presentation will look at some of the specific examples of the biophilic laws. So the first one we look at is a San Francisco a Sidewalk Landscape and Permitting Program. And this began when an owner of property was, uh, I guess, basement property or ground level property was experiencing stormwater runoff uh, filtration from the sidewalks into her uh, apartment. And she requested from the city, she asked them if she can convert where some of these double wide sidewalks into green infrastructure to capture some of that stormwater runoff. Uh, the city agreed, and that successful pilot program has become the model for uh, what is now a permitting program throughout the city. The, pr the projects are landowner designed and implemented projects um, with you know some basic elements like you have to provide access to parking uh, and the like, but because they are you know, influenced and driven by individual property owners, I think you get a wide variety of interesting projects throughout the city. And so lots of biophilic improvements that the city, all they have to do is agree to allow, you know, residents to have some role in how their city looks. In Tucson, Arizona, uh, they've come up with a, a variety of tools to protect their seasonal washes. So water scarcity is obviously a, a primary concern for Tucson. Uh, to, the city of Tucson is located between Saguaro National Park West and East, and the washes run through the urban areas. Um, so through highly developed areas. And so a variety of tools have been developed to protect these critical uh, riparian resources. The first is the adoption of an overlay zone for essentially the 100-year floodplain. And says for any new development in that area, uh, the, the property owners have to develop a hydrologic study to understand both the impacts that would result from development and also to the, the extent to which they can mitigate those impacts. Uh, and if they are unable to mitigate those within critical riparian area, essentially development is forestalled. So it really puts the, the emphasis on individual property owners to map and understand kind of the ecological value of these washes and how their developments are impacting these riparian resources. The last piece of the puzzle is the protection of native species. So as the city terms it, they're trying to avoid converting a fire-resistant desert to flammable grasslands. And so there's a no net loss provision for the protection of native species. So if a development is required to remove any native plant species in making the development, they're required to you know, supplement that by replanting elsewhere or even replanting off-site. In Denver, Colorado, uh, they provide an excellent example of viewshed protection. So cities across the country, which are located in dynamic and interesting uh, spots want to protect the viewsheds from the city to the environmental resources outside of the city. 
So for example, in Denver, in 1968, there was a public debate regarding the construction of high rises on the edge of a public park and the blocking of the views of the Rocky Mountains that, from that park. Uh, and the result was the adoption of the first viewshed ordinance for the city to protect the views from that park. And Denver has moved on to adopt a similar viewshed ordinance for 15 other locations within the city, which include public parks, uh, city hall, some of the, the sports stadiums within the city. And the general process is, you know, you identify a viewpoint and then increasingly allow the size of development to increase and building heights to increase the further you get from the view area, so to protect those views. Also in, uh, so actually, actually a little bit more, here's a, on the right is a map uh, of that's within the code. So each one of these uh, view shed ordinances has a, a particular map that identifies where the development can occur and the size of permissible structures. Staying in Colorado in the city of Boulder, so Boulder sits even closer to the Rocky Mountains and is really on the doorstep. And that's one of the primary values for that city is to have this immediate access to dramatic nature. Uh, but at the same time, you get the entry of wildlife into the city. And so the challenge is how to maintain that, that vibrancy of having access to nature and having nature come into the city, uh, but also humanely protect that wildlife and the citizens. And so one of the very basic things they did uh, was to require bear-proof containers for portions of the city uh, to decrease the incentive for bears to come into the city and either, you know, get harmed or have to be put down because of the interactions that were resulting with residents. Another provision that Boulder has undertaken is a wildlife impact report requirement for any new development. So the report requires uh, an inventory, an assessment of impacts from potential new development to wildlife, and then also potential for mitigation and recommendation. Uh, and again, much similar to that Tucson or ordinance regarding impacts to the washes, you know, if you're not able to mitigate your potential impacts beyond a certain degree, then potentially you have to limit your development. So it can be a pretty powerful tool to protect wildlife. Um, one of the very first kind of recognitions and protection of nature for most cities across the country is the protection of urban tree canopies and trees. Um, the traditional model is to protect trees of a certain diameter or certain tree types. Austin is amongst uh, some of the more progressive municipalities in identifying how you protect these urban tree species. Uh, by protecting the whole critical root zone. So it, it doesn't end at the trunk of the tree. Um, if you want to increase the likelihood of these urban tree survival, you need to be protecting the critical root zones uh, and really thinking about holistically what the tree needs in order to survive. Um, and so there's limits on construction within the vicinity of the critical root zone and also uh, limitations on what type of modifications there can be to the tree crown. So uh, a limit of 25% removal of tree crown during growing seasons, uh, all with the aim of not only protecting identified tree species, uh, but conserving them uh, so that they last and they can be sustained. San Francisco has adopted uh, provisions to protect birds in building design. Uh, in 2011, San Francisco adopted a comprehensive requirements that relate to new construction and for buildings undergoing significant renovations. That 2011 ordinance identified that upwards of 1 billion bird deaths occur in North America alone annually because of window collisions. Uh, and that these numbers can be significantly reduced by building design. So that ordinance identifies both location-related hazards as well as feature-related hazards that potentially impact birds. 
in terms of location-related hazards, it's really identifying areas that birds are more likely to use. So uh, within 300 feet of open water, uh, inland water bodies or open space greater than two acres in size. So if birds are likely to be using an area, they want to control the design of buildings within the vicinity of those of heavily used areas. And then feature-related hazards include freestanding glass walls, wind barriers, skywalks, rooftop greenhouses, other attractants and potential hazards for birds. So in the vicinity of both these types of hazards, they, they try to limit the amount of glazing or windows on buildings, so no more than 10% glazing in certain areas. They also limit lighting design, so um, an emphasis on shielding lights or directing lights down. And the last is limits on wind generation. Flagstaff, Arizona is uh, the first international dark sky city as of 2001, and it places dark skies on par with other environmental qualities like clean air and clean water on uh, attempts to control light pollution uh, through a variety of regulatory mechanisms. It has adopted a pattern light code. Uh, pattern light code refers to um, the regulation of the total amount of light per area consistently across the landscape, but it creates differentiations in the types of zones. So, you know, less light is allowed in rural areas versus urban areas, uh, and then differences between residential and non-residential areas and the like. Uh, but for the most part, attempts to set a consistent and easy to apply standard for the amount of light that's permitted in these areas. Um, some types of lights are permitted out, prohibited outright, like floodlights and searchlights, uh, except for emergency purposes. Another type of regulatory approach, as opposed to this pattern light code, is the adoption of regulations to regulate the types and design of light fixtures. So as I was referencing before when talking about the bird regulations, you know, shielding lights, directing lights down so that there is less of the associated light pollution uh, with a uh, light design. Seattle, Washington is one of many cities in the country that's adopted and permits urban, urban agriculture in the city. I use Seattle as an example just because of the extent and the, the the kind of flexibility of what they allow in terms of urban agriculture within the city. Um, since 1973, Seattle has allowed community gardens. And in 2010, they put together really one of the most comprehensive regulations regarding urban agriculture. So within the city, um, small animals are allowed, such as pot-bellied pigs. Um, large animals like horses and cows are allowed on parcels that are bigger than 20 acres in size, which is, you know, a significant size for a parcel in a city, but to the extent that those parcels do exist, large animals are allowed. Bees are allowed, chickens are allowed, no roosters, um, and you're also allowed to sell your produce on site. So that creates this network of kind of local grown food access uh, across the city. They do put limitations on urban agriculture in residential areas to kind of mitigate some of the impacts associated with urban agriculture operations, such as erosion control, uh, water quality impacts, parking and noise, and also the use of pesticides. So there is a conscious effort to control, uh, to both allow urban agriculture, but also to mitigate the impacts of it uh, within these urban areas. In Los Angeles, there has been a um, now, I guess, two decades old effort to revitalize the LA River as a, a destination for communities to access nature uh, and also derive all the benefits that come from a healthy riparian area. And the LA River really bisects and crosses many communities in LA. Uh, and so one of the efforts that LA has undertaken is to adopt what they call a river improvement overlay district, which is 
an effort to guide development in those areas so it's sensitive to maintaining uh, the river and providing access to the river. Uh, the attempt is to create a river identity for many of these communities that sit adjacent to the river but may have you know, turn their back on the river or may not have access to the river at this point. Um, so how to create a connection between those communities and the river, you know, to facilitate walking, biking, allow for ecological restoration, native species growth, much like the kind of in that the picture at the bottom is a vision as to what the LA River could look like as opposed to, you know, the top corner there. Uh, and again, one of the critical aspects is creating access to the river, especially for many of the low-income neighborhoods that, that sit adjacent to the, to the LA River. In Washington, D.C., uh, Washington has adopted something it calls a green area ratio, which is a green landscaping requirement for new development. So a percent of the footprint of all new development uh, needs to have vegetation and landscaping uh, to capture stormwater runoff uh, and provide other environmental qualities like pollution control. Uh, it creates a basic formula and identifies different landscaping elements and then uh, gives you credit towards meeting your ratio requirement based on the area that you apply that ratio, I mean that green landscaping element on. Uh, and the other piece to mention is uh, maintenance is required. So, you know, if you, it's not enough to install these green landscaping elements. You have to care for them and ensure their sustainability over time. Otherwise, you'll be required to meet your obligations either on site or elsewhere uh, in response. Toronto, Ontario. Um, in 2009 became the only city in North America to require green roofs for new development beyond a certain size, and that's residential, industrial, and commercial developments, uh, and requires an increasing percentage of building space, or roof space, dedicated to green roofs, the larger buildings get, uh, up to 60% uh, for the largest category of buildings. If a developer does not, choose to put a green roof on their building, they can pay cash into a fund, uh, which is called the Eco Incentive Fund, and those those funds are used uh, to promote and, and undertake green roof projects elsewhere in the city. So regardless, there is the same net benefit to the city uh, in terms of green roofs. As of 2015, as a result of their programs, Toronto indicates that 260 new green roofs have been constructed uh, over 2.1 million square feet in size. Uh, they indicate there's already a uh, total 440 green roofs in the city overall, so a pretty uh, impressive effort uh, with the dramatic impacts. That's an overall survey of some of these uh, biophilic codes. We are going to be updating the Biophilic Cities website uh, to provide access to these codes and to provide more information regarding these codes. I authored a law journal that provides a lot of information uh, on some of the codes that I talked about uh, and also a lot more codes. So, if you're interested in seeing more detail on some of the things I discussed today, take a look at that. Uh, and then lastly, you know, if you have questions, if you have interest in this area, please contact me uh, and we can start a conversation. So please do not hesitate to contact me. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you, JD. Um, I guess we have just a couple questions for you. Um, first off, um, are there any types of biophilic codes that are standing out in your mind as maybe the most popular or the trendiest? Um, or are there any issues that are specifically drawing a lot of attention right now? Yeah, you know, I, I think um, anything that has utilitarian function, so things like uh, control of stormwater, you know, some of the provisions that have been adopted by, you know, Washington, D.C., like that green area ratio or the requirement or 
you know, some of the incentives for green roofs to control stormwater. I think those are you're seeing those crop up in a lot of places because it has the dual benefit of promoting nature, but also providing benefits to the city uh, in terms of its infrastructure development. Um, you can see a lot of dramatic savings uh, related to the development of green infrastructure that the city would otherwise have to spend on some of the more traditional models of of um, utilities like stormwater control. So it's interesting. I think you see a lot in that area. Mm. Um. So, and what are some of the, maybe the biggest challenges to implementing biophilic ordinances and what might be some ways to overcome those? Yeah, I think probably the biggest challenge is um, a lack of political will. So, um, I think overcoming that probably requires providing the information to legislatures that this is a, a process that has benefits that are really tangible for the city. So, you know, there's economic benefits, but there's also dramatic cost savings uh, in terms of, you know, pollution control and the like, not to mention that it attracts, you know, new business and interest in the city. So um, I think overcoming kind of potentially a lack of desire to invest in uh, some of these biophilic efforts, you know, Probably the most challenging part to get them implemented wow. in the first place. Um, great. Okay. So, in are there any? Um, you obviously recommend. Um, you know, people can learn more about Phillips Cities. Um, your law journal. Are there any favorite sources of yours? Maybe um, people you follow or um, websites you peruse um, that you'd recommend to anybody interested in learning more about Phillips Codes. Yeah, you know, I um, again, I might refer to the law journal because in there, there's quite a few citations to a lot of resources that I use pretty heavily in developing that law journal article. Uh, and the, you won't see reference to biophilic laws or maybe even the term biophilic, but you will see, you know, reference to green infrastructure planning and uh, planning for urban wildlife, wildlife protection, things like that. So if you're interested in this topic, sometimes you have to get creative in what you're looking for in terms of the sources. But um, I think green infrastructure in particular is a very, a topic that gets a lot of interest right now and there's a lot of writing on it. Uh, to me, the challenge is to not only kind of embrace that desire for green infrastructure, but also, you know, how do you at the same time create an amenity that, you know, allows residents to interact with nature and experience nature in, in its native form. So it's probably not enough just to create, you know, natural systems, but do they mimic, you know, the biodiverse elements that you would see for those regions? And I think that's where it becomes the most challenging. Okay, thank you, JD. Um, thank you for your webinar, and um, thank you, everyone, for listening. That concludes this Biophilic Cities webinar. Thanks, Rebecca.